Thank you. Thank you so much. Give a bigger hand for Jesus today, everybody. All right. You, you may be seated. Uh, I, I, first of all, I would prefer, Kiwi, thank you. I'd rather you come up and just do this whole session. That was remarkable. Thank you for your story and your life. And, I mean, wow. Thank you for being here. Incredible. Uh, my 17-year-old daughter's birthday is today, and I travel a lot, okay? So it's, it's pretty normal for me to miss her birthday, but my wife's mom had open-heart surgery the day before yesterday, so my wife had to leave home. So my 17-year-old is without her parents on her birthday, which breaks my heart. And, uh, and so if, if you would do this, I want to Snapchat her all of you just saying, happy birthday, Ashlyn, okay? Her name is Ashlyn. We adopted her on her birthday 17 years ago today, the greatest day of my life, one of the most amazing experiences ever in a small little town in Kansas in the hospital. We got to spend our first night in the room with her, and uh, it's just, she's, she's my baby. And so, kind of on, on a one, two, three, everybody, happy birthday, Ashlyn, and then just cheer until the little seven-second snap ends, all right? <laughs> one, two, three. Oh, thank you so much. That, that will be the greatest thing I could give her. That is awesome. So now i got to send it to her. And technology, you know, Snapchat, what is that? Oh, my goodness. My goodness. Thank you so much. Um, thrilled to be here. Thank you, uh, Pastor Benny and Wendy, for having me. What a huge privilege to be with all of you today. I uh, am quite honored to be at Church of the Highlands. Pastor Chris Hodges was my youth pastor 27 years ago. Uh, in Colorado Springs, Colorado. That's where my life was greatly impacted by New Life Church and, and him as my youth pastor. And, and we were together in ministry there for several years. Then he moved to his home state of Louisiana, went back to his home church in Baton Rouge for about seven years. So we were separated, but we stayed close. He did my wedding in that time. He would, I would call him my first funeral. I called him, what do I do? And my first wedding, I called him, what do I do? And all those things. And so he was, he's been my pastor for 27 years. And it's just, fun to be a part of the Church of the Highlands and, and get to do this with you. And so a couple statements just to start this off. And I am speaking today as a, as a staff member, as an associate pastor. And so I, I believe what I'm going to share with you will uh, impact pastors, senior pastors, but this message is for everybody else, okay? So uh, I, I, I'm, I am not a senior pastor, never have been, and so I am speaking from the associate standpoint, that, uh, really a message that is deep in my heart uh, about ministry. And so opening statement is, uh, success is exciting, finishing is essential, perspective is everything. I had a pastor that didn't finish, and it devastated me. Probably the hardest thing I've ever gone through, including deaths in my family. Like, like so finishing is essential. Perspective is everything. And so what I want to call today's message is seven perspectives on or backslash for success. So, so if you're successful right now, this is going to give you some perspective on that. If you're not successful, I believe this is going to give you some perspective on becoming successful. It's fun to win, right? I mean, it's just fun to win. My life is really good right now because my Denver Broncos are world champs. Every day, every day I wake up a world champion. So yesterday might have been a bad day, but I woke up today a world champion. Go Broncos. Thank you, Peyton Manning. We, we love you, man. All right. I live in Alabama, which means every day I wake up a national champion, Roll Tide. I don't see any Alabama fans in here other than John with me. Roll Tide. Roll Tide. And as Pastor Benny said, I won the Pikes Peak Hill Climb this year, so every day I wake up a Pikes Peak Hill Climb champion. So it's just winning is fun. It's a lot of fun, but it's fun to win you know, when your team wins, you know, go, go Alabama, roll, tide, roll, all that stuff. But it's more fun when, when you're on the winning team. So I, I think the Denver Broncos, the players 
are more excited about their world championship than any of us fans. Because it's fun to be on the winning team. And many of you are on winning teams right now. Your churches are winning. Those of you that are at Church LV, you are on a winning team. This church is winning. This church is taking ground. This church is growing. Great things are happening. And it sure is fun to win. It's a lot of fun to win. But as we win or as we're going to win, because I believe if you're not winning now, you will win in your future if you just keep on moving. Come on, somebody. The winds are coming, so we need to have some perspective on that. So let me start here. The first perspective we need, I'm going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 3 as Paul sets us. Uh, uh, I, I believe this is a great perspective paragraph in the scriptures. Paul is trying to bring some perspective to the Corinthian church that's kind of out of whack as it pertains to looking at Paul and looking at Apollos. They're, they're elevating them to an unhealthy pedestal. Right. And so the apostle Paul is like, guys, you're, you're missing it a little bit. And so this is really going to set us up for all seven of these things. First Corinthians three, five through 11. After all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We are only God's, everybody say, servants through whom you believe the good news. So here, this is the uh, Apostle Paul. This guy is a big deal. This is a big leader. And he's saying, you guys, I'm just a servant. Let's put this thing in perspective. Us in, in perspective. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it. But it was God who made the seed grow. Everybody say grow. It's not important who does the watering, who does the planting, or who does the watering. What is important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work together for the same purpose, and both will be rewarded for their own hard work. For we are both God's workers, and you are God's field. You are God's building. Because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it. But whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, wow. Jesus Christ. Wow, okay, so there's some perspective from Paul. So here's what I believe as, as an associate pastor in ministry for the last 15 years. The first perspective that we need to have is the right perspective of the pastor. That needs to stay healthy. See, this church was, they were, they were off. They, they'd actually gone overboard with the whole elevating and, and honoring thing, which, which we're going to talk about that a little bit, but, but he's just trying to bring some balance. And so he called himself a servant and he called himself a builder. He did not call himself an apostle. He was, he was very, very clear in his language. And so we need to have the right perspective on the pastor. And here's something we have to understand, associates and and staff members, is the vision for the church you're a part of was in your pastor before it was ever in you. You got to keep that in perspective. Because God is going to, if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, he's going to give you dreams and visions. But that is not to detract from or go a different direction than but you are to build upon the vision of your pastor because that vision is in them first. And it will always have originated with them, not with you. So we are to build upon it, not detract from it. And you might think, well, God gave me a great vision. There are a lot of great visions out there, but if there are two visions on your team, that is called die, die vision. They might be great. Well, you can't be, well, it can't be division because it's a great vision. It's from God. No, it's a different vision. It is a second vision. It is an unhealthy vision because it is a division. It is going to bring division. And so we have to understand where the vision came from first. Long before I ever moved from Colorado Springs to Birmingham, Alabama, Church of the Highlands was stirring in the heart of my pastor. It is his vision, and I am there to build upon it, not detract from it. And practically speaking, I think one of the greatest things we can do as staff members is learn your leader. Learn your leader. Learn your pastor. Learn about them. What what, what, I mean, this sounds silly, but what are their love languages? 
What, what, what are their needs? What, what, do they, what, they, what they need most from you? How can you serve them the best? You've got to learn your pastor. You've got to learn your leader. Some of you maybe work a level or two down. So maybe you serve daily underneath another pastor on the team of your church. Learn that leader. I mean, I, I've, I've had to learn over the years. I, I, pastor Chris, his, his love language is not words of affirmation. Mine is. So I, I would have a tendency to just tell him all the time, bro, oh, that was amazing. That was the greatest message I've ever heard. You're incredible. Thank you. And that means nothing to him. So I, we have a tendency to communicate what we want. But I, I have to remember, Pastor Chris's main love language is acts of service. So what can I get done for him? It's going to communicate a love for him more than you're awesome. I love you. You're amazing. But that's my leader. Your leader, your pastor might be different. You, you, need to, you need to learn those things, simple things like, I learned you do not write my, my pastor a long email. He will not read it. You don't need descriptives. You don't need details. Like, get to the point. So I can help him if I keep my emails few and far between and very clear. I'm serious. So, so I know, like in the subject line, I put short list, like just so he knows, okay, Lane's got a short list and I make it as short as I can because, because I know that matters to him, but every one of us have different leaders and your pastor, his love language might be words of affirmation, but your love language is not. So your love language is acts of service. So you're doing this and working hard, doing all this stuff at the church, trying to communicate that you love your pastors. And yet what they need to hear from you is you're awesome. I love you. What a great message today. Thank you for leading the way you do. We need to learn our pastors. We need to, we need to be able to bring that into our perspective, that we actually have a, a, a real knowledge of, of what they are and what, how they're wired and their personality type and, and those type of things. And we, we've, got, we've got to understand the power of that relationship, that, that, that God, put it this way, I... I, 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 I honestly was not called to Birmingham. When you grow up in Colorado Springs and you see Pikes Peak every single day of your life, you never dream about Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> that does not happen. And I believe this in so many cases that God will supernaturally put a love for a city in the senior pastors. Beyond that, God does not build his kingdom locationally. He builds it relationally. Yeah. God is a relational builder. He is not a locational builder. So I was not called to Birmingham. I was not called to Alabama. I was not called to Church of the Highlands. I was called to Chris and Tammy Hodges because God builds relationally. And so I am there. I am not serving my city. I am not serving my church. I am serving my pastors. Now, what's, what's really cool, and I was quite terrified when I first started feeling like God was calling me to Alabama. I, I had nightmares of humidity and bugs and lots of trailers and just, just, I just, I'm just sorry. I had no, I'd never been to Alabama, so it was freaking me out. But when God calls you relationally, I believe he will change your heart for that location. So for 15 years, I have not missed Colorado one time. That makes no sense if you've ever been to Colorado Springs. I mean, it's just, now Birmingham is beautiful. It is not what you would expect. It is a great, great place. It's actually at the end of the Appalachian Mountains. So we still have some mountains in Birmingham. It's very lush and green. It's beautiful. But God just supernaturally put a, a love for that place in me because I am called to my pastor and they love that place. When you really love someone, you love what they love. Yeah. Wow, that's good. It's, just the, it's just true. If you really love me, wow. you're going to love Ashland. Like if you really know us and if you're going to be a part of my life and you're going to, if you're going to really have a relationship with me and you honestly love me, you're just automatically going to love Ashland. And so it's just what, what God does in that. We had a, a student, we teach this to Highlands College. We have a ministry school with about 900 students in it. And we tell them, don't, and, and Pastor Chris told me this when I was 17, trying to figure out where I was going to go to Bible college and how I was going to get into ministry. I was called. I was ready to go. I was freaking out. And Pastor Chris said, don't worry about what. Don't worry about where. Don't worry about when. Don't worry about how. 
All you have to focus on is who. Greatest advice I ever had when it came to my future in ministry. So we teach that to Highlands College students. We, we place our graduates. We have a placement program. The only reason Highlands College exists is to put students in full-time ministry. So in that placement process, one of our superstars, his name's Josh, got three full-time paid youth pastor positions from three great churches. But he had heard for years that he'd been in Highlands College. It's not what, where, when, why, how. It's who. And he came and he met with me and he said, you know what, Lane, I... I can't shake the fact that I am supposed to be with David Perkins. David Perkins planted a few weeks ago in Kansas City. Josh turned down three paying jobs to go serve as a volunteer at Radiant Church that launched three Sundays ago. He moved there three months ago, and I, I get texts from David Perkins. Josh is the man, nothing else. Like, like uh, another text, Josh is running everything. <laughs> Another text, I don't know what I would do without Josh. I mean, that church launched with over 700 on launch day, and they've stayed over 400. You know, that's a big deal for the last two weeks. And now Josh is in the right place, even though he's not getting paid. Because he went to whom he was called. He went to the right pastor. But back to the honor thing. Yes, Paul said, okay, he said, I'm a servant. I, I'm a builder, okay, so let's take me off the pedestal. Let's lower me down a little bit. But also, in 1 Timothy, we read this. The elders who direct the affairs of the church are worthy of, everybody say double, double, double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. So in the midst of bringing some balance, we still have to remember that our pastors are worthy of double honor because we do not understand the weight. I've been in ministry a long time, but I do not understand the weight that Wendy and Benny go to sleep with. I do not understand it. And nor will I stay, stand here and say I understand. I do not understand the weight that Dr. Maiden has to go to sleep with and, and, and think about. I don't understand it. But what I do know is what the Bible says, and that they are worthy of double honor. Yeah. In a healthy balance, obviously, right? So the right perspective of the pastor, the right perspective of the pastor is one of honor. Number two, the right perspective of the position. Of the position. So many of us have dreamed about positions. I dreamed of becoming a youth pastor. I prayed to become a youth pastor. I was called to be a youth pastor. So in my mind, in my thinking, it was always about the position. But here's the deal. Even though I was technically the youth pastor on my business card for the first 10 years of Church of the Highlands, I was not the youth pastor. Pastor Chris was the youth pastor. You're not the children's pastor. Your pastor is the children's pastor. You're, you're, you, 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 you get it all mixed up. I, Daniel, where you, where's Daniel? You're not the youth pastor, bro. Sorry. There's your youth pastors right here. So we have to, we have, to have the right perspective on the position because it's, it's actually not supposed to be about the position. We are, as Paul said, servants, right? So your influence does not come from a position. It should not come from a position. Your self-worth does not come from a position. Well, I didn't get the associate or I didn't get the associate pastor title or I didn't get the youth pastor title. I'm the assistant to the assistant junior high youth pastor and all of a sudden we're crushed and our self-worth goes down. You are looking at it the wrong way. You have the wrong perspective on the position. Your security should not come from a position. Do not aspire to a title. You're missing the point. Don't hold tightly to the title. Don't hold tightly to the position. Everything I've done at Highlands, Pastor Chris has taken from me. Everything I wanted to do at Highlands, I no longer do. It's been stripped from my hands. And I wish I could tell you that I had open hands every time. I did not. Sometimes as he pulled it out of my hands... It left gouges and blood and torn muscle and ligament. Almost lost my hands once. 
because I was holding so tightly onto what I loved about ministry and the position I loved and the influence I thought I had because of a position which I did not. And so I can, I can honestly tell you, I was, I was our college pastor. We were, we were growing. Our church was growing. We, we were a few campuses, but I was, I was still a campus pastor and our student pastor, and I was preaching every week to college students in our college service. And Pastor Chris said, hey, when we move into our first building, I want to just shut down the college ministry. Like, what, am I not good enough? Like, did it not grow enough? It's only the biggest in Alabama, and I'm not a good enough leader? Like... I'm not saying this, I'm thinking this. Like, like, you guys know what I'm talking about. Like, is it my preaching? Like, is it, is it because it's getting so big I've got too much influence? Like, what is it? And it was eating me up inside. And I was doing uh, equip training. I was over in Europe doing equip training, and I could take you to the, the street corner outside of the hotel when I couldn't take it any longer. I called him from Europe. This was, this was 10 years ago. It was an expensive phone call. In tears, I can remember almost yelling at him, I don't understand why we're shutting down one, which was the name of our college service. I don't get it. I, f I feel like I'm not good enough. I f so I just poured my guts out. He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. We're going to plant two campuses next year. This year, it was, it was in the year we were moving into our building. We still were going to launch two more campuses. He's like, I don't need you focused on one college service. I need you focused on the whole church. We've got to launch some campuses. And I'm like, so it doesn't have anything to do with my preaching? Like, <laughs> like, like I just, I was so embarrassed. Like, I, I, I was all wrong. Like, all my, all my thoughts were wrong. He had more for me to do, and he had a bigger picture than I could see. And I was all about the position, and I needed to just let go of it. And so since that time, I've let go of a few other things. And I learned it doesn't hurt as bad when you're just like, whatever you want me to do. Pastor, where do you want me to serve? I'm just glad to be on this team. I don't, I, and I haven't, I haven't had a business card in 10 years. Since that time, I've never carried a business card. We're just not about titles. We're just not about positions. If I had a business card, it would have to say something on it. I don't want it to say anything. I love being on the team at Highlands. I don't need a title. It's not about the position. Verse 7 said it's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. It doesn't matter. We're just all on one team. So here's the deal, everybody. Ministry is a privilege, not a position. It's just a privilege for us to, to be a part of it. John Maxwell gives the five levels of leadership, and I, I just want to quickly go through this so you'll see this. If you're about position, you're actually about the lowest level of leadership. If position is important to you, you're, you don't even get leadership because it's the bottom rung. Five levels from John Maxwell. Number one, position, lowest level. People follow you because they have to. Number two, permission. People follow you because they want to. So you start going up a rung here. Level three, leadership is production. People follow you because of what you have done for the organization. Number four, we're climbing the ladder of influence. People development. People follow you because of what you have done for them. And then the last one, I don't believe that you can get till many, many years later in life, later in ministry, and that is the pinnacle. People follow you because of who you are and what you represent. So if position is important, you care about this level of the ladder of influence. It's time to move on. The right perspective of the position is that it's a privilege. That's the right perspective. Number three, the right perspective of the paycheck. Uh-oh. We're going where it hurts. We're going where it matters. I have seen the switch from volunteer to staff mess some people up. I have seen getting paid to do what you did for free mess you up. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. Here's what we tell our staff at Highlands. We do not pay you for services rendered. We do not pay you for services rendered. We believe in this so much, we actually pay people. It only really kind of kind of makes like really makes sense at the very beginning. We actually pay people on their first day. 
for the month ahead. We pay one month at a time. So my first paycheck, I raised my own support for the first year I was at Highlands. I was, I was, I was on staff, but I was self-supported. My first paycheck came the month, the first day of the month that I would work that month just to make sure our staff knows we are not paying you for services rendered. It's a different perspective. We are, what, why, we, why do we pay staff then? We pay our staff so they don't have to work at Walmart today or in the police department today or at the law firm today or at the bank today. We are paying them so that they can be available for ministry. We are not paying for the ministry that they've already completed. Because when they feel like they are getting paid for what they've completed, it gets all messed up. It gets all, now, now it's just a job. It's just a job. And that is a dangerous place for it to be. Your paycheck does not equal your value. Some of you are, are, are underpaid. Okay, so, so, so it starts to eat at your self-worth, and it shouldn't. Some of you are overpaid. Raise your hand if you're overpaid. See, nobody's going to say that. <laughs> the guy that came with me, John Jones, raised his hand. We'll work on that. All right. But, but whether it's high or whether it's low, your pay should not be attached to your self-worth or your value. Because because we're in ministry. I don't know about you, but I was doing ministry before I ever got paid to do ministry. Hopefully, that's the case for all of us. We were at some point a volunteer. We were just doing it because we loved God, not because it paid something. So your ministry is a calling, not a paycheck. I went to a church in South Florida, two, three thousand, three campuses. The pastor, dear friends, hey, while you're here, after you teach our staff, would you go and meet with every department head? There's about seven or eight people for about five minutes and just, just give me a report back on what you find. So I met with his department heads. One of the first questions I always ask church staff leaders is, do you lead a small group? And it was shocking to me that these staff members, these department heads at a very large, very successful church, several of them, not one, not two, like three or four of them said, Oh, I used to lead a small group until I came on staff. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. So we're going to stand up on Sundays. Hey, everybody, we want you to serve on the team. Hey, everybody, we want you to be in a small group. Hey, everybody, we want you to lead a small group. Yet when we're on staff, we want them to work a 40-hour week and then lead a small group. But I don't need to do that because I'm on staff. That's what I said. Whoa, 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 whoa. We have missed it. We have missed it. So I, you know this pastor, when I sat in his office, I said, bro, you're not going to believe what I found out. I said, I said, none of your staff are leading small groups, none of your department heads, and, and whatever it was, three or four of them quit leading a small group, and their reason was because they're now on staff. He almost fell out of his chair. He almost called an emergency staff meeting. Like... <laughs> Like, like he, he, he was like, no, that can't happen. That can't, but it did happen because, because their mindset shifted. Now this is my job. I do ministry for a living. Why do I need to lead a small group? So at Highlands, I, I, I'm, I'm on staff. I get paid. I work hard. I, I put in my time. But I lead a small group as a dream teamer, as a volunteer. Not because I get paid to do it, because that's what we do as Christians. We are connected to the body as Christians. So, so we, we've got we've to make sure that we've got the right perspective of the paycheck. The right perspective of the paycheck is that ministry is a calling, not a job. Wow. Number four, the right perspective of the platform. Now, most of us don't get a literal platform. Okay, so most of the people in here... Uh, are not preachers. Maybe you, if you're a youth pastor, you get a platform. Maybe if you're on the worship team, you're on the platform. So, so let me settle this. The platform is influence. So don't just think the stage. As soon as you step onto a staff, as soon as you are a part of a winning team, hopefully, as soon as you're on the team, you step onto a platform of influence. You have influence now that you did not have before, and you need to have the right perspective of that platform. 
First of all, and this, I would say this to senior pastors, the platform is not yours, it's his. That's for all of us. It is not yours, it's his. In the one-year Bible today, it said in Colossians, it said, Christ is the head of the church. Did not say the senior pastor is the head of the church. Okay, So it's his, not yours. I like to say it this way. The platform or the stage or the influence, the platform is not for your gain. It's for their growth. So the only reason God gives us a platform is for people, not for us. So we should never use our influence or or that platform that we have by being on this team for our personal gain. We've lost perspective and it gets unhealthy when we're in that place. And you need to understand that that platform is bigger than you. Even senior pastors, it's bigger than you. It's bigger than your teaching gift. It's bigger than the word that God gave you to speak. Like it is bigger than you because it is Christ's body. It is his bride. It is his church. None of you would care. None of you would care what I would have to say if I didn't work at Church of the Highlands. I'm not here because I'm Lane Trans. Think about it. I'm the same guy I was 12, 13 years ago. Why do you care what I have to say? Because now I happen to be at a church that might be the second, third largest church in the country. So you are listening to me. I'm the same guy I was 12 years ago. Nobody called me and asked me to speak. So the platform is bigger than me. I did not earn it. I did not get there on my own. It, I, can't, I can't. If I start to think it's because of me, I am on my first step toward destruction. Because I, it, it is not, I am not here because of Lane. I am here because of Church of the Highlands. I am here because of a platform that God has allowed me to be a part of. Verse 10, because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it. What do expert builders do? Are they experts at sheetrock? Are they expert at stained concrete? Are they experts at, uh, at, at framework? No. Expert builders don't have to be an expert at anything but hiring expert subcontractors. And so what I like to remind myself is, see, I started Highlands College in my basement 15 years ago with 17 students. Now there's 900. I started our youth ministry with a small group with five students in my basement 15 years ago. We do a once a month student gathering that now has over 5,000 junior high and high school students. Last Thursday night, we had over 2,000 college students gathering. So we're about 7,500 students in our student ministry, started in my basement. I can start to think that's pretty cool. I can start to think I'm pretty cool. I can start to think, you know what? I started all that. Come on, Lane. So let's think about this for a second. Let's take Lane out of the equation. I never moved to Birmingham. Does that mean our student ministry has zero people in it today? Does that mean that Highlands College has no students in it today? I don't think so. God is going to build his house with or without you. An expert builder will always hire another subcontractor to get the job done. So I have the privilege that I got to be the sub. I'm just a sub, and there's a lot of them out there. It could have been any of you could have got to be the sub. And so I have to keep that in perspective or it's going to go to my head. I'm going to, I'm going to think it was all about me. And it's, it, it, it just can't be that way. What we say, how, like what I am a part of, what Lane is a part of, what I'm a part of is bigger than the role I play. So much bigger, so much bigger. God will give you opportunities because of your platform, not your talent. So I would love to think, you know, I'm just a great communicator. I'm so good. That's why I got to speak at Supernatural. No, I didn't. It's not because of my talent. It's because I work at Church of the Highlands. It's because I happen to be on this platform that has given me this opportunity. Now, that is not an excuse not to work on your talent and not, not to be faithful what God gives you and not to grow and get better. I hope I'm better at communicating than I was 15 years ago. God help us if I'm not. 
So I'm not saying that, but we've, we've just got to keep this. Remember, this is perspective, perspective, perspective. The right perspective of the platform is that it's not yours, but God's. Number five. The right perspective of the pain. Tough days are coming. If you've not had them, most of you have. I don't understand your tough days. I don't know about your tough days. I'm actually quite embarrassed to talk about one of my tough days in front of Dr. Maiden because this man has been faithful through tragedy like none of us could imagine or we would want to happen to our church. Like, I honor you in front of everyone here. If you don't know his story, it's absolutely amazing. And so I'm going to share some pain, but not not comparing it to your pain or his pain or anyone's pain. I know you guys have been through serious pain, some of which you shared last night. But it's just a part of ministry. It's just a part of it. And so it, when it's a part of it, we got to have the right perspective on it, okay? So, so how, do we, how do we look at the pain? Of course, we, we have to understand that our battle is not against flesh and blood. I, I, was, I was with our college interns at, in Tuscaloosa, Roll Tide, last Thursday night. And, uh, and one, I, we were doing a Q&A after the service. I wanted to spend time with them, and a student just, just said this. He said, what is the, the worst and the best part of ministry? I said, one word answer, bro. I didn't even have to think about it. People. People. It is. It is the worst, and it is the best part of ministry. Pain almost always comes from people when you're in ministry. Of course, there's physical pain, sickness, disease, but for some reason, those, don't, those aren't what stands out to me. I mean, it's the people. It's the pain caused by people. But we don't, we don't need to look at the people as the problem because our battle is not against people. Craig Rochelle, you've probably heard him say this. Your level of success will be determined by the amount of pain you can endure. I believe in that statement. I believe that to be true. In June, while I was in, in Colorado racing the Pikes Peak Hill Climb, I had Ashlyn with me, my oldest, my youngest, 14-year-old Devin, and my wife are at home alone at 3.30 in the morning. I, can, I know the end of the story now, so I can tell you, we didn't know this then, but a mentally unstable, delusional 33-year-old who I was his college pastor 10, 12, 13 years ago uh, came to our house, my pickup truck sitting outside in the driveway, took a screwdriver to the whole truck, every, every panel, every light, every part of the truck, windows, screwdriver, climbs up onto the truck, onto the hood, takes his pants off, and takes a dump on my truck, pees all over it, gets a gallon of house paint, pours it all over the truck, $12,487 in damage to the truck with a screwdriver. Then breaks into the house at 3.30 in the morning with my baby sleeping in her bed. Thank you, Jesus, for an alarm. When he got through the front door, the alarm went off, and he hightailed it. Thank you, Jesus. Took off. Took weeks to figure out who did it. His dad actually called because we've dealt with him in the past. I have six years of delusional emails from him. I mean, he's been angry at me at the past, but he's never acted out like this. So then we find out it is a personal attack from someone I pastored against me and my family. That's some pain. It happens in really one of the greatest weeks. of I've raced Bikes Peak Hill Climb for 23 years. It was my biggest week. It was my biggest win. I've got sponsors like Geico and Valvoline. I mean, I, I mean I've, got, I've got a lot on the line for my, my, it's my hobby. I do it once a year. It's not, I mean, it's not a career at all. I, it's like a hunting trip for me. Those the Alabamians always have a hunting trip. They go for a week. <laughs> Well, my week is in Colorado, and I get in a race car. So I'm having this amazing week, and I get an attack like that on my family. It was, it was, it was horrible. And we live different now. He's, he's out on bail. He's not arrested. So, so my babies are home, and I don't know if he'll come in the, in the middle of the day. 
I don't, I don't know. So we're, we have to live different. We have college students that stay with them. We're, I mean, you just live different. There's pain. There's pain. Every one of you have stories. These pastors have stories. But you've got to have the right perspective on it. Every time I've gone through pain, I've wanted to quit. God, it's just not worth my 14-year-old. It's just not worth it. I don't even know why I'm doing this. And then, and then you got to get perspective. Wait a minute. So one, one person can destroy 15 years of ministry. One person can make you want to quit. Like, I got to get it in perspective. And honestly, I wanted to quit. I want to be done with it. I was in the towing business before I moved to Birmingham. I, I ran my dad's towing company, large, big trucks. It's like nobody was ever, ever crapping on my car in the driveway, breaking in my house when I was running the, running the towing business. Like, God, let, I can go back to the towing business. I, I just, I, I, let me just hook up to a garbage truck and just take it back to the shop. I got other things I can do. Got to have the right perspective on the pain. It just happens. It's just part of ministry. First Thessalonians 2.2, 2, you know how badly we had been treated at Philippi just before we came to you and how much we suffered there. Yet our God gave us the courage, everybody say courage, courage. to declare his good news to you boldly in spite of great opposition. The right perspective of the pain is that it's worth it. So when you're hurting, you just got to know it's worth it. I would never want anybody to go through what the maidens went through. But Dr. Maiden, would you say it was worth it? He said, yeah. It's just worth it. Because how small is what I experienced compared to the cross? <laughs> how much more did he suffer? for the kingdom than, than my little home invasion or whatever you want to call it. Number six, the right perspective of the praise. This is not praise to God. This is praise to you. We have this privilege. We have this calling called ministry. So we get to help people. And when people get help, they get happy. When they get happy, they get thankful. And so they begin to heap praise on us, heap praise at us. Oh, pastors, thank you so much for the small group. Thank you for how it's changed my life, changed our marriage. Thank you so much for what you do. Oh, that was the greatest message I've ever heard in my life. Tear coming out of their eye. It's like, wow. If you've ever preached at the L.A. Dream Center, yeah. what happens after you preach at the L.A. Dream Center? Pastor Matthew or if Pastor Tommy is there, they will tell you with all genuineness, 100% look you in the eye, and they will say, it is the greatest message I have ever heard. And you're like, I'm a tow truck driver. I'm a tow truck driver, and I just preached the greatest message ever heard by the Barnetts. You better have some perspective on the praise. Don't let the praise land on your ego. Let it land on his grace. <laughs> Benny asked me to say it again. Don't let the praise land on your ego. Let it land on his grace. We, we need to be polite. I'm not telling you to be like, no, 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 no. Like, don't be rude. Thank you very much. I'm honored. I'm privileged to get to do this with you. I mean, you, 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 you can say it in a way. You know, cause see, God is going to use you because he loves people. Yeah, that's so good. He loves people, so he needs us to minister to them. So he will use us, but we have to handle it the right way. Because the enemy will use praise to destroy us with pride. All of a sudden, we start thinking we're a great counselor. Oh, yeah, four marriages saved just this year. Thinking we're a great small group leader. We're a great worship leader. People come up crying, oh, God moved in that second song. Thank you so much. Well, I was leading that second song. What's the perspective? Accept compliments, deflect glory. Accept compliments, 
deflect glory. James 4, 6, he gives grace generously, as the scriptures say. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. He's referring to Proverbs 3, 34. Let's not forget where we came from. I'm still a tow truck driver, have the privilege, have the calling, have a platform, I'm still the tow truck driver. Don't forget where I came from. Verse 6, I planted the seed in your hearts and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. you got to write this down. The right perspective on the praise is that the power is in the seed, not the sower. Let that settle in for a second. The right perspective on the praise, on the compliments, on the accolades, on the pats on the back, on the big hugs, on the tears, on the you're amazing, is that the power is in the seed, not the sower. If you've ever wondered why God could be using a man of God or a woman of God who is in deep immoral sin, it's because the power was never in them anyways. I, I'm a sinner, they're a sinner, we're all sinners. So is there a line where God can't use a sinner? Well, I don't think so, because whether their motives are false or pure, as long as the word is preached, it's effective because the power is in the word, not in us anyways. So when you think you're, you're given some great message and you're given some great word, whoa, 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 it's not yours. It's not effective because of you, it's effective because the power is in the seed. Perspective, perspective, perspective. That thought healed me from my senior pastor of 12 years of moral failure and the pain that I was experiencing. I, I, was, I, was, I was grieving for more than a year and Rob Hoskins from One Hope, they distribute Bibles all over the world, uh, his daddy, Bob Hoskins, shared that with me, that thought, and I was healed instantly, instantly. Because it all came into perspective. You know what? We just get to give perfect seed. We get to give powerful seed. It's not on us. The praise can never land on us. Number seven. I have three minutes. The right perspective of the prize. This one's really easy. You already know this one. Our prize doesn't exist here on earth. Our treasure is in heaven, right? I'll quote the great theologian and the great general Maximus Aurelius. What we do on earth echoes in eternity. Like, that's where it is. That's the right perspective. Colossians 3, 23 through 24. Do your best. Work from the heart for your real master, God, confident that you'll get paid in full. When are you going to get paid in full? At the end of the month, on the 1st, the 15th. No, you're not going to get paid at all until you come into your inheritance. Keep in mind always that the ultimate master you're serving is Christ. Our prize is not the position, the platform, the pray, the, 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 the pay or the praise. Our prize is our inheritance. The right perspective on the prize is that it's in heaven. My prayer for you is that you would be able to hopefully hear from a guy that's so grateful. A guy that 16 years ago would have been laying underneath a waste management garbage truck pulling the drive shaft so I could tow it into the shop. A guy that grew up with a dad that raced cars up a mountain and drove tow trucks for a living. And I am just blown away every day that I get to do what I get to do. Thank you, Jesus, for choosing me. It is a privilege to stand on this stage, to have this platform. And we've all seen it crash and burn. We've all seen it tumble underneath people. And my prayer is that it doesn't tumble underneath you. In the name of Jesus, the right perspective. God, give them the right perspective over every person, every staff member, even senior pastors, God, that we would always maintain the right perspective on our success or for our success. In Jesus' name, amen.